Welcome, Dr. Seabro. Now, this is a multi-sectoral sort of effort. Where do you get the information from to implement? Hello, thank you so much for having me this today. Um, the information to manage the HIV and AIDS response comes from various sectors. It will come partly from the Ministry of Health. The Ministry of Health, as you can imagine, would have a significant amount of information for the HIV response, the testing information, the treatment information, all the information coming from the laboratory sector. That will come through the Ministry of Health. Then we would have different things that we may access through colleagues in the Ministry of Labor. We would access information from surveys. We would access information from the Central Statistical Office. All of these things would inform um, HIV and AIDS response, as well as we would get information from our NGOs. And as we try to expand the HIV AIDS response and make new friends, we are going to begin to source information from different places. Um, because we're now going to have to expand our response to look at issues related to gender and climate change. And so as we expand our response, we're going to make new friends. And in terms of making those new friends, though, expound on that a little bit for me, please, because I think some people may want to know, how do you connect the dots in terms of the challenges managing the HIV AIDS response and where those factors of gender and climate change fit in? So in terms of HIV, one of the things um, that's very important to acknowledge, this is about vulnerability. Um, people are very, very private about their sexual and reproductive health. It is something that struck, strikes a chord for many people. It's not something that everybody is out about. And so vulnerability is something that is cross-cutting. And so where um, our marginalized, marginalized groups in our population are, are, are affected by HIV, they're also affected by STDs, they're also affected by poverty, they're also going to be affected, for example, if they were a there was a disaster tomorrow, you will find that there will be crossover in terms of some of the groups that are going to be affected. And so for us to be able to really think about how we want to chart a course to a future where we have um, no AIDS as the way we know it. So we're moving to 2030 where we want to have no more AIDS. We want to eliminate AIDS in 2030. So we want to, we have to think about vulnerability in Trinidad and Tobago from a sexual and reproductive health perspective, what that means and how we're going to support people who are living with HIV and affected um, or maybe at high risk, how we're going to support persons to stay on treatment beyond treatment um, and we have to be able to support them in all contexts in in a safe time when everything is fine in an unstable economy where we have shifts as well as when we have disasters so we have to be able to project and vision forward for how we protect our vulnerable population and so for us we are also going to lean heavily on the ministry of social development in terms of social vulnerability for persons from all groups, the very young, the very old, and everybody in between. And in terms of that psychosocial aspect, we, we, we will get back to that. But some of, the, some of the colleagues that we spoke with previously, they spoke about, as you did, getting to the end of HIV AIDS as we know it. And that brings the question of viral load. And with that, I'd ask for a definition from you, please. And what are some of those uh, the factors that may aff affect viral load? So in terms of getting to 2030, the goal that we have as a country is that we want to be able to test everyone who could potentially be infected with HIV. And we talk about 95, 95, 95. But truth be told, if we could do 100, 100, 100, that's what we should be going for. But we want to make sure that everybody in Trinidad and Tobago who's infected with HIV can get a test. And once those people can get a test, we want to make sure that those persons can have treatment. And once, once people are accessing treatment, we want to make sure that they are successful at that treatment. So that success in treatment means that you can achieve a viral load that's undetectable. So we have, a, we have ways in, in, in management of HIV where we would take blood from someone and we can quantify the amount of virus in some in a in a certain proportion of blood and so the higher the virus the higher higher the viral load 
that means that the person is not controlled. But the medication, once the person is taking their medication well, then they can have an undetectable viral load. And that's where we want to go. Because undetectable equals untransmissible. And what that means now, if we had 100% of our population tomorrow who is HIV positive, undetectable, it means that we are looking towards a future where we have less cases, less new cases of HIV. And we're not going to be, we're not going to see AIDS in the way that we know it in the future. So that is, that is the goal. It's a, it's a, it's going to take a lot for us to get there, but I think that we can do it together. But it's always said that it, it's, it makes sense to have a large vision that you can work towards in terms of those incremental steps. But the fact is that there are individuals who you can determine the amount or the level of viral load. Mm -hmm. So that means that there, there are factors that influence. Yes. What are some of those factors? So the factors that would, would influence, in the first instance from the viewpoint of the person, somebody has to be empowered enough to be able to take their medication every day um, so that they can achieve an undetectable viral load. If somebody does not take their medication the way they're supposed to take their medication, they can become drug resistant, and that's going to affect their ability to have a successful outcome. So the personal, the, 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 the very taking of that medication and being empowered enough to take that step to come forward for treatment and commit to yourself to take your medication every day, even when you don't feel like taking it on time and get your viral load undetectable, that's one, that's one thing there. The other thing that we think about, because we think, we always think about a disease in isolation, but when we think about anybody tackling anything that may have caused a little bit of an upset in their lives, people need support. People, we need support. So, so where you have a treatment supporter, people who have treatment supporters tend to do better. Someone in your corner going, take it now, yeah, 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 you're all right. Somebody who can go and get your medication on a day when, boy, you're, you're stuck at work and you can't get your medication. So treatment supporters, family supporters, you know, you need people to give you a hug on a bad day. Um, so, so that's going to affect your support. Uh, as well as at a community level, you don't need somebody in your community um, going around, you know, that girl of AIDS, you, you, that is counterproductive because for communities where you have people in the community sharing a juicy story, you're destroying a life um, because that's going to affect that person's spiritual, their energy. You're going to throw that person's energy off. And so the amount of determination to get up and go and get medication to get have an undetectable viral load um that that's gonna affect Definitely it's gonna be limited to but in terms of the the to get up and go we need to take a short break we are coming back we're speaking with a dr ayana sebro technical director of the national aids coordinating committee stay with us we'll return with more Welcome back. We are speaking with Dr. Ayana Sebro, Technical Director of the National AIDS Coordinating Committee. And Dr. Sebro, one of the things that I want to ask about is, is there just one type of antiretroviral medication? Oh, no, there are several. Antiretroviral therapy comes, I like to say, in families. And so there are a few families, well, more than five. At, but we in Trinidad and Tobago will access a, a wide spectrum of the medication and so when we give medication we will give medication we will give you three we will give you three active drugs across at least two two families so you're going to get three three sets of medication but in what is available at this point you're going to get one tablet a day once you us once your virus is going to respond to that type of medication and is there anything that is contraindicated? Because I know some people, well, some types of medication, you're supposed to have it with a meal. Some is supposed to have it before, after, or not on an empty stomach. Uh, some people uh, may be wondering, if I take this, should, what time of the day should I take it? Will I be able to drink with it? What are some of those things that you go in? So some of the things, when somebody, so everybody's regime is going to be, so we would have a general approach in terms of, for the most part, most um, the majority of people will get one type of medication, and then if they can't, they will get a different set of medication. But 
for people, we would encourage for persons to take, for example, there's one that sometimes people get a little dizzy with it, that type of medication we advise that you take at night. We want to make sure that persons have access to food um, so that they can have their medication and, and they have the adequate nutrition to support um, the immune system in the first instance um, and then medication. But there are some medications we have where you don't have to have it on a full stomach. There are some things we may not want you to, be, you know, we, we would not recommend at all any time taking your medication with alcohol. That's not something you're going to hear from a doctor um, or a nurse. <laughs> Um, but when when somebody starts medication, um, for the most part, you will have an individual counseling session to kind of get a sense of what is your life pattern, what is your lifestyle, and how and when are you going to fit your antiretroviral medication into that pattern to be able to support your ability to sustain medication for a long time. And does, does the age of an individual or their viral load have any influence on the, on the family? of antiretroviral treatment that you in, that you introduce them to so the med so what what really is going to determine the medication in the first instance what we would look at for example is what is the virus susceptible to once the virus is susceptible then that's the first the first thought the next thing is what can this particular person's body take in that is the person's kidney function up to par is the person's liver function up Optimum. If the person has normal kidney and liver function, then we can go forward in a particular way. If not, then we have to make adjustments. And so those are the things that we will consider. Sometimes we would consider if somebody has a history of mental illness, we may not use particular types of medication. Um, but for the most part, it's really the virus, the susceptibility of the virus to the medication, and then the body's ability to manage the medication. If we follow the train of thought that says that it is really society that disables individuals, when we're looking at persons who may have different levels of ability, and to get back to that social aspect of what you were speaking about earlier, uh, dependency on adults, social systems, what are some of those things that need to be kind of scaffolded in place when we're dealing with minor children, people with disabilities, who are positive for HIV AIDS? But in, in terms of how people are supported, if you think of, for example, food security, housing security is going to be important in terms of how we address um, our HIV response going forward. Our people living with HIV need to have a balanced meal. And so it, they need to be able to have access, as well as they need safe shelter because once they're disabled, dis, dis, disturbed, if there's that social vulnerability, then you're going to have, it, it's gonna be a, a lot more challenging. As well as if we, if we were to, to push at the inequalities, where, for example, there are some communities that are marginalized, the very policies of the state, um, or, for example, the community approaches to some people in the community may affect somebody's ability to be able to access testing, treatment, and care. Um, and so the enabling environment, the enabling policy environment to be able to support people to be able to access medication. Uh, and when we think about our young people, um, a special plug for our young people in terms of how we support them. And so we have to think about the young people in terms of not just the ones who are well supported, Let's look at the ones who are not, the ones who have no one, the ones who may be in a home or maybe um, they've lost their parents, those types of things. And so that um, their dependency on the wider society and community to be able to support their safety, um, to be able to support their access to prevention, treatment and care, even to information, that's an important thing. So some of the information that we have at this point in time shows us that um, some of our young people are not achieving um, viral suppression in the same way that the adults may. Um, and that's because of their vulnerability. They are dependent on someone else to be able to get that medication. And so we have to be able to, as we move forward to end AIDS, we have to be able to now begin to pull apart all the different groups 
um, we, we haven't begun to pull apart the eras in terms of extremes of age as well. But can you imagine somebody who's been living with HIV for 23 years and has not disclosed to their children that they're HIV positive? And, and sure that is the mark of a good conversation when there's so much more to, to we, we've left a lot of meat on the bone. So that opens the doorway asking like Oliver Twist for more. But we really want to thank you, Dr. Sebro, Dr. Ayana Sebro, te Technical Director of the National AIDS Coordinating Committee, looking at this very timely subject. And on behalf of the entire TTT News team, this has been In Depth with me, DK Ronstadt. Thank you so much for joining us.